so hi everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday Compass Seminar this week. We are going to hear from Haley Royer, who is a fifth year student in our Atmospheric Sciences Department. Her advisor is Dr. Cassandra Gaston. Haley has a Bachelor's in Geological Sciences from USC and several years of experience working as a geologist. Here she's focused on aerosol chemistry and mixing state, and her talk today, Aerosol Mixing State and its Effects on Air Quality, Cloud Formation, and Nutrient Deposition, is going to cover just some of the work she's done during her time at Boston School. So I'll give it to you now. Thanks, Hope. Okay, so as Hope said, um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about this idea of aerosol mixing state and the ways that it affects um, uh, the climate and also uh, human health. So just for Anybody who's not familiar, I assume most of you are, but just so we're all on the same page, I want to start off with what an aerosol actually is. Um, so aerosols are solid or liquid particles that are suspended in a gas, and oftentimes you think about paint, like spray paint or hairspray um, as aerosols, but um, we actually have atmospheric aerosols, in which case um, the gas they're suspended in is the atmosphere itself. Um, and there can be both anthropogenic um, sources of aerosols, which can include things like shipping emissions, it can include um, soot from fires in, inside your house, um, or emissions from the, uh, the combustion of fossil fuels in your car. Um, natural sources of aerosols can include things like sea spray, mineral dust, or pollen from flowers. So there are a lot of sources of aerosols, but why do we even care? They're really small, they're everywhere, but why does this really matter? Um, so there are two sort of overarching reasons why we really care about aerosols. Number one is human health. There are a lot of ways that aerosols play a role in our health. Um, as you know, Floridians, um, at least for the time being, you're probably familiar with the harmful algal blooms that take place uh, pretty regularly around the state. Um, there are studies that show that the um, algae or the toxins from these algae can actually get aerosolized and locked into the air. Um, and if you inhale them, if anybody inhales them, they can actually cause a detriment to human health. Um, COVID-19 is also a really excellent example of why aerosols matter. So uh, the way that COVID is transmitted from person to person is through aerosols um, that you produce when you talk, when you speak, um, when you cough, sneeze, even when you breathe, you produce aerosols. Um, and if those aerosols contain the COVID-19 virus and somebody else inhales them, that's how you get transmission from one person to another. A particular matter on its own is actually a marker of air quality. So when you look at sort of the air quality for the day, oftentimes you'll see things like ozone, um, like ozone mixing state, um, and also particulate matter concentrations. Um, so you can see here that the smaller the particular matter is, which is sort of denoted by like the one, which is one micron, 2.5 microns and up, um, the smaller the particle is, the deeper it can get into your lungs and the more it can affect your respiratory system. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is just a really relevant topic. So this is um, from the sort of environmental disaster in East Palestine, Ohio, um, where a train carrying vinyl chloride was tipped over, um, sort of spreading to, to the area, and to sort of mitigate the problem, um, authorities have been burning the toxin, um, which is basically the reason why everybody's been evacuated from the area, because when you burn it, you aerosolize it, and you sort of spread it around in the air. Um, so inhaling this could be like a huge issue because vinyl chloride is a carcinogen. So a lot of different ways that aerosols can impact our, our, our own health. Um, we also care about aerosols because they play a lot of roles in the climate. Um, this is a diagram showing um, a couple different ways that aerosols affect the climate. So number one, aerosols can, um, and they have radiative properties on their own. So they can both uh, scatter and absorb sunlight depending on what they're made of. So things like mineral dust, which are more reflective, will scatter sunlight, whereas things like soot will actually absorb sunlight. Um, aerosols also play a role in uh, cloud formation. So without aerosols, we actually wouldn't have any clouds at all. Um, and depending on how many aerosols are present, what kind of aerosols are present will affect the radiative properties of the clouds through something that's called the aerosol indirect effect where um, a smaller number of aerosols will result in sort of larger droplets that are more absorptive and therefore more absorptive clouds compared to um, having a larger number of aerosols in, in you know, the space where the cloud is forming will sort of result in uh, water spread across multiple aerosols and then uh, smaller cloud droplets and more reflective clouds. Um, finally, um, aerosols can contribute to um, climate through nutrient deposition. 
So mineral or mineral dust or soot particles can contain things like iron and phosphorus, which are often limiting nutrients. Um, and when those are deposited into ecosystems that are nutrient limited, they can actually enhance biological productivity, enhance the uptake of CO2 from vegetation, and therefore act as a cooling force on the climate. So a lot of different ways that aerosols um, are important. And when we think about the way that aerosols play a role in the climate, we really especially care about this particular reason because aerosols are the greatest source of uncertainty for climate change prediction. This is a figure from the IPCC 2014 report showing um, the different sources of forcing. Um, and what you can see is that on the bottom here, we have aerosol radiation interactions and also aerosol cloud interactions, which very clearly have the largest amount of uncertainty out of all the forcings that we have, um, that we've been studying for the past several decades. And if you break this down, um, you can actually see that these are the three topics that I just discussed. So the aerosol direct effect, which is um, aerosols being reflective or absorptive on their own, the aerosol indirect effect from cloud albedo, which is um, aerosols affecting the size of cloud droplets, and also um, the effect, the aerosol indirect effect from biogeochemical cycles, which is aerosols depositing nutrients and affecting the uptake of CO2. So aerosols are really important to study. I feel like I've made a pretty compelling point on that, um, but they're also really hard to study. Um, and one of the reasons is because there is a large chemical uh, diversity and complexity of aerosols. Um, so these are just like a few like very, very basic examples of what aerosols can be composed of. So things like sea salt, sulfate, smoke, dust. These are all really common components um, that aerosols can be composed of um, in the atmosphere. Um, and they can also be composed of combinations of each of these things. Um, so a lot of uh, diversity and complexity that we're contending with. Um, the other issue is that aerosols can undergo reactions when they're in the atmosphere. So they can react with the sun through photochemical reactions. Um, they can also uh, absorb water, so they can be coated in water, and that can affect their reactivity. Um, they can also react with gases. So things like organic gases or acidic gases that exist in the atmosphere can actually react with aerosols and change their chemical composition and radiative properties. So in general, very hard to study aerosols because there's a lot going on with them chemically. Even though they're so small, they still have a lot of, um, a lot of difficulty um, when you're trying to actually like, study what's going on with them. Um, so the way that we usually contend with this, or the way that we have contended with this historically, is to simplify the complexity. Um, so generally, we do this through what are called bulk analytical methods. And this is usually done by taking a mass of aerosols that's collected in any number of ways. Oftentimes, we use filters. Um, we'll soak them in, um, in something like water, um, we'll dissolve any of the soluble material that's on the aerosols, and then we'll remove the aerosols and then analyze the water that, you're, that you've dissolved the aerosols into. Um, the issue with doing this is that you basically assume that one particle is the same as any other in an aerosol population. And uh, this brings up a couple of questions. Is this the same assumption? Are all aerosols the same? And if you do assume that all aerosols are the same, what are you losing? What is this? What are we forgetting when we, you know, disregard aerosol complexity? So this brings up the idea of aerosol mixing state. So aerosol mixing state is, uh, by definition, the distribution of physical and chemical properties across individual particles. So when we look at bulk analytical methods, what we're assuming is that each aerosol has the same size, it has the same shape, it has the same chemical composition, and that chemical composition is uniform throughout the entire aerosol. Everything is the same, everything is homogenous, no aerosol is unique from, one another, from, from another. Um, as we know, this is really incorrect. Um, so uh, what the reality is, I'm going to show my mouse here. Um, so the reality is like we get something more like what we're seeing on the far right here. Um, so what we're looking at here is basically a figure um, where we're seeing aerosols of different compositions, and those compositions being distributed differently within each aerosol. So you have some cases where you have fresh sea spray, which is just sodium and chloride. Um, you have some particles that are just fresh soot, which is mostly carbon. Um, you have some particles that are uh, you know, half uh, aged dust and half sulfate. And then you have other situations where in this center particle here, else? in this center particle here, you have a sulfate particle that's coated in some organics. Um, so basically, what we're lacking here is the physical and chemical complexity of, of like what we actually see in the aerosol population. Um, and this can have a lot of effects on the way that aerosols actually, um, actually interact um, with gases, um, with ecosystems, with clouds, um, 
So how do we actually get these? Well, we use what are called single particle methods, where you actually analyze an individual particle, um, and you do you know, analysis of like thousands or millions of particles in order to get an idea of what the actual aerosol loading looks like. And the way that single particle methods usually work is by, just as, as an example, um, you have a single particle, you, you know, target it using um, either a laser or a um, microscopy, and you'll shoot an x-ray at it or a laser at it to basically analyze the surface of the particle. Um, so what this will get you is the um, size and chemistry of a single particle, um, and also more specifically, you end up getting surface chemical composition, um, which is important because generally when you're talking about the way that aerosols interact with the atmosphere, you're mostly concerned with the surface because that's what's going to be exposed to gases, that's what's exposed to sunlight, that's what's going to interact with water. Um, so this is generally like what we see as like the main uh, the main area of import on, on an aerosol particle. So this brings me to the main question that I'm trying to tackle with my dissertation, which is helping single particle methods further our understanding of aerosol impacts on air quality, cloud formation, and nutrient deposition. And to sort of get into my chapters, the first thing that I want to discuss is air quality. So chapter one is how does aerosol mixing state affect air quality? And for this chapter, I'm going to focus specifically on tropospheric ozone. So stratospheric ozone is something that we're all familiar with. It's the ozone that's in the ozone layer. It's protecting us from UV radiation. But in the troposphere, uh, ozone has a different role. Because um, in the troposphere, uh, ozone is a greenhouse gas. So it's you know, a warming force on the planet. And it's also a criteria air pollutant. So it, has, um, it, can affect, uh, it can cause respiratory distress. It can cause rubber cracking, say like on your car tires. Um, it can also cause leaf burn. So it's not great for vegetation either. Um, the other thing is that it's really common in urban regions, um, which you know, sort of adds some import to studying this area uh, or studying this particular con or this uh, particular uh, chemical because it's typically an issue in areas of really high population density. Um, and this is one particular example of Salt Lake City, Utah, where we see um, really intense ozone events. And that's sort of what I'm going to be focusing on today, is specifically Salt Lake City. Okay, so how do we study tropospheric ozone? In this case, we're going to be focusing on a compound called nitro chloride. Um, nitro chloride, or ClNO2, is a precursor to tropospheric ozone. So what I'm showing here is a figure from Ostop et al. Uh, 2008. Um, I know that there's a lot going on here, but I just want to focus on two things here. So I want to focus on this red trend here where we see this is ClNO2, and we see it increasing. This is a temporal plot um, from Galveston, Texas. Um, so we're seeing that around 6 a.m. It starts increasing. It starts increasing, and then it'll decrease down to about noon. Um, and then what I also want to point out is that sort of around the time that the ClNO2 starts decreasing, we see an increase in ozone, in tropospheric ozone. So basically, I'm just trying to make the point here that ClNO2 is leading to the formation of tropospheric ozone. So in this case, we're going to be using ClNO2 as a proxy for tropospheric ozone. Okay. So in order to get ClNO2 formation, we need three ingredients. We need a source of chlorine. We need a source of NOx, um, nitrogen oxides, which are typically from anthropogenic activity. And we need water. So. There, typically, we assume that this reaction or this mechanism for tropospheric ozone formation occurs in urban coastal regions because you have a large source of NOx from anthropogenic activity, you have a large source of chlorine from the water, um, especially you know in the ocean, the water is very salty, that's where the chlorine comes from, is that saltiness. Um, so you have the two main ingredients that you need for ClNO2 formation. Um, they can interact with the atmosphere and actually form ClNO2. Um, I don't have time to get into the actual mechanism for ClNO2 formation, but somebody asked me at the end when I'm done, because I have a really great animation, but I don't have time to show you right now. Um, so, uh, so we, you know, it's not surprising that we see this forming in, in coastal regions, because we have a lot of chlorine from the sea. Um, but we also aren't expectedly seeing this in inland urban regions as well, which is kind of surprising. So we see it in Salt Lake City, we see it in Denver, um, which on the one hand, you have a lot of NOx from the anthropogenic activity, so you know that sort of doesn't make sense where the NOx is coming from, but the chlorine is sort of weird. So um, we weren't really sure where the chlorine was coming from until just recently, um, where 
uh, it was sort of found that it could be coming from dried up salt lakes. So for example, um, the Great Salt Lake is a major source of salt um, around Salt Lake City. Um, that's why it's called Salt Lake City. So uh, a lot of studies have actually shown that this could be a major source of the chlorine. It could be the reason why you're getting uh, while you're getting ozone formation in these regions where we don't usually expect it. Um, so previous literature that has actually studied this, this uh, topic have used mostly bulk methods to study and predict ClO2 formation. Um, so this is that same method that I was talking about earlier where you are basically taking a mass of aerosols, you're soaking them in some sort of water, and then you're taking the water um, after removal of the uh, aerosols and you're analyzing the water for its soluble content. Um, so this has been done and uh, previous work from Bertram and Thornton in 2009 actually created a parameterization to try to predict the formation of CNO2 based on bulk methods using um, just the concentration of chlorine from the bulk method that I was just discussing and water, which would be basically uh, relative humidity. So the, a, a couple of assumptions that you have to make when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at this parameterization are number one that all the chlorine comes from halite, um, and this is relevant for the water component because um, water uptake of halite occurs at about 30% relative humidity. Um, typically, you don't expect to see it less than 30% relative humidity, uh, and this is worked into the parameterization, which you can see is represented by the black line and the gray sort of shading on the plot here. The, only, the other thing that you have to assume when looking at this parameterization is that only chlorine and water will affect relative humidity. Uh, I'm sorry, only, only chlorine and water, which is in the form of relative humidity, will affect ClO2 formation. Um, and you can see this on the x-axis. The only things that are being um, input into um, the control variables are chlorine concentrations and water. Um, but the thing is, so all of these symbols here are actually from a true at all 2019, um, and this is showing uh, observations from laboratory studies of CLNO2 formation from different playa materials. So you would expect that based on the relative humidity that you're on the experiment at and based on the chlorine content from bulk analysis that you should be following along this parameterization, but we don't see that at all. Um, the parameterization is not really following what we're seeing observed. Um, which basically suggests that the uh, bulk analysis-based parameterizations are not capturing the entire story, namely because the bulk, the, the bulk methods are not sufficient for explaining um, the chemical mechanism that's taking place. So the main question that I'm trying to answer with this particular chapter is what can single particle methods tell us um, based on this, uh, uh, you know, on CLNO2 formation? So the first assumption that I talked about was whether or not uh, chlorine comes from halite. So that's the assumption that like all of the chlorine that we see comes from halite. Halite is an ACL, it's a table salt, it's a very common salt mineral, and it's, you, it would usually be a fair assumption to assume that a, the majority of the salt that's in, you know, something salty is going to be halite. Um, but let's see if that's actually true in this case. So for this, um, to tackle this question, we used single particle analysis. Um, in this case, we're using standing electron microscopy coupled with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. Um, and with this, uh, basically, like I was showing before, you have a single particle that you image with a microscope. Um, you shoot an X-ray at it, and then the X-rays will tell you basically the surface chemical, surface elemental composition of a single particle. Um, so we do that, you know, 200, 300, 400 times um, with each sample. Um, so we do see a lot of instances where sodium and chlorine are present. Um, so this is just an image from SEM, um, and this is basically the elemental composition that we get from the instrument, uh, from the EDX component. You can see that there is sodium present and there is chlorine present. So in this case, we do assume that halite is present, um, which is a pretty fair assumption to make. Um, but we also have instances where we're looking at individual particles and we're seeing that uh, Chlorine is present, but sodium is not, which tells us that something else is present. Something else is attached to the chlorine. So there are other chlorine-containing minerals present in these samples that are potentially contributing to ClNO2 formation. And when we start comparing that to ClNO2 production, we see something really interesting. So if we plot ClNO2 production, which is on our y-axis, against particles, the number of particles that contain both chlorine and sodium, which we assume is halite, 
we don't see a really good correlation. There's not really a strong relationship. However, when we plot ClO2 production against particles with chlorine and without sodium, so assuming that these are particles that have um, chlorine containing minerals other than halite, we see a really strong correlation, um, which sort of suggests that uh, chlorine containing minerals other than halite are actually more important for ClO2 formation um, than halite is when relative humidity is low. So the next thing that I want to discuss is whether you know, chlorine and water are really the only important things. So not only can chlorine be in different forms, but there are, you know, when you look at mineral dust, it's not just chlorine. There's a lot of other chemical components in there that could potentially be playing a role um, in this mechanism as well. So for this, what we're going to be using is a different single particle analytical technique. We're using something called single particle mass spectrometry, which basically will take a single particle, shoot a laser at it, and then it ablates the surface of the particle. Um, so you have basically surface uh, compounds shooting off um, and analyzed by the instrument. So um, what I'm showing here is a relationship between the organic material uh, that is found in each sample um, and the nitrogen oxide absorption of each sample. So I'm gonna walk through this really quickly. Um, so the organic material is plotted along this y-axis and is represented by the bars here. You can see that each of these bars is representing one ply sample. Um, and as you move right, you're increasing in organic material, okay? Um, NOx uptake, which is basically uh, a measurement of how much uh, nitrogen oxide is actually being reacted on the dust particle um, that would supposedly be able to react with the chlorine to form uh, ClNO2 um, is represented by the symbols here. And you can see that as you also move right, you are decreasing in NOx uptake, which sort of suggests that as you, so you're increasing in organic material, you're decreasing in NOx uptake. So the NOx is not really reacting with particles that have a lot of organics on it. And what we think is happening is, uh, oftentimes what will occur with organics is that they will coat the outside of the particle. So if you have something that contains a lot of chlorine and it's coated in organics, the NOx can't react with the chlorine because it's covered in the organics. So it's basically acting as a, as a block um, to um, that reaction between the chlorine and the NOx to form ClO2. So basically the takeaway here is that organic matter can coat dust particles and prevent the uptake of NOx, which therefore uh, prevents uh, ClO2 formation. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about for this particular chapter is where CMO2 formation takes place on a particle. Um, so generally we used, um, we used bulk methods to try to understand this. Um, so in this case, we're looking at uh, CMO2 production plotted against chlorine that's determined from a bulk method. And you can see that the correlation isn't very good. Now, if we use single particle methods, we actually see that there is a really good correlation if you look at two different trends here. And these trends are actually really easily explained by the things that I already discussed in this presentation. So with the, the blue line, um, we're seeing that you don't necessarily need a lot of sodium chloride, which is plotted on the x-axis, um, in order to get high ClO2 production because you have minerals other than sodium chloride uh, that could be contributing to ClO2 production. Um, for the red plot, we see that we have other constituents that are actually inhibiting ClO2 formation, such as organics and clays, which I don't really have time to get into here, but if anybody has questions about it, I'd be happy to show you some figures proving this. Um, so basically you have, uh, yeah, you have components that are inhibiting the formation of ClO2. Um, and if you look at it this way, uh, the single particle methods are actually doing a really great job of um, predicting, or at least like understanding how ClO2 production is occurring. And because of single particle methods, which are based, which give us uh, more detailed surface chemical composition, um, are working better than our bulk methods. This sort of suggests that this is a surface chemical composition, not a bulk chemical, comp not a bulk uh, mechanism. Um, so this suggests that we need to actually be using single particle methods to study and predict this mechanism. So the main takeaways for this chapter are number one that halide is not the only chlorine containing mineral of importance for this mechanism. Um, other chemical components like organics can affect ClO2 formation. And finally, ClO2 formation occurs on the surface of the particle, so single particle methods are needed to predict its formation.
So the next thing I want to get into is how aerosol mixing state affects cloud formation. Um, so if we go back to what we sort of talked about at the very beginning, we were talking about how aerosols affect the climate. Um, we brought up this figure and I was talking about how um, aerosols are a major source of uncertainty. If you look at the uncertainties from the different sources of aerosols, um, the largest one bar none is aerosol cloud interactions. Um, so uh, more than anything else, aerosol cloud interactions are the largest source of uncertainty for climate change prediction. So we really need to know how aerosols are affecting um, the formation of cloud droplets. Um, and we're really interested in understanding how this is occurring in the tropical Atlantic because in the tropical Atlantic, we have a, uh, a lot of shallow cumulus clouds that are geographically and temporally pervasive. So they're happening all year round and they're also um, far, far spread. So what we did is we sampled during the winter of 2020 at Ragged Point in Barbados, which is a field site that's been, um, that was established back in the 60s as if, and has been used since then to study long range transport of dust across the, uh, across the Atlantic from Africa to the uh, Caribbean. Um, so we sampled from uh, basically in the month of February of 2020. Um, and during this time period, we see the dust emissions were, were present. And you can see here on this plot where the darker color represents higher dust concentrations um, and that blue star representing Ragged Point. Um, we do have dust transport to the area. Um, I also want to point out that we did have fire emissions during this time period as well. So in February of 2020, this is a plot from um, a NASA model, which is showing the intensity of fires in the African Sahel. Well, the African Sahel experiences its burn season during the boreal winter. Um, so that's why we're seeing such high fire instances here. And we will see uh, some of the effects of these fires in, this, um, in our findings here as well. So the methods that we're using here, we're using basically, to, again, be comparing bulk and single particle methods. Um, so the first thing that we're looking at is dust mass concentrations, which we determine um, essentially by taking a mass of aerosols, mostly on a filter, um, we wash them with water um, to remove the soluble content, and then we combust, um, combust the remaining filter. And what you get from this is basically just the dust, um, the dust that's been transported. Um, for our single particle analysis, we're going to be using, again, SCM EDX, which gives us uh, elemental composition of the surface of individual particles. Um, we're doing this computer controlled, so we're able to get a lot more uh, statistical, um, able to get a lot more numbers of particles, basically. So each, each sample that we looked at, which was essentially one hour for a day sampling, um, we got like 1,000 or 2,000 particles, which is a lot more than we had for the last, um, for the last chapter that I talked about. Um, the last thing that I that, you know we have data from is um, size result cloud condensation activity. Um, so when I talk about size result cloud condensation activity, what does that actually mean? So um, CCN or cloud condensation nuclei are basically basically particles that can form cloud droplets is just very simply um, what that means. Um, so size result means that we're looking at it across a variety of sizes, so we can actually see which size particles are more likely to act as CCN than others. Um, and from this, we can also get what are called kappa values. Kappa values are basically, basically just measurements of water uptake properties um, and the ability for, um, for a particle to act as a cloud condensation nuclei. So the values for kappa range from 0 to 1.4, where 0 is non-soluble dust, and 1.4 is highly soluble sea salt. All right, so just to jump in, what do bulk methods tell us about aerosol cloud interactions? So what we're looking at here on the top plot, and just pause on the bottom plot for a second, but on the top plot, we're looking at dust mass concentration. So this is our bulk method, um, where we're just basically burning a filter um, and weighing the ash out. And what you can see is that there's essentially three time periods where we're getting dust arriving to, um, to Barbados, right? So for this bottom plot, what I wanna focus on is basically the color of these of these markers here. Um, so what we're looking at is a change in kappa, right? So during the time period where we don't have any dust in the area, we have very little dust in the area, the kappa is 0.53, which means that the CCN are more absorptive. Um, when the dust arrives, kappa changes, the cloud dynamics change. It decreases, which means that the, the materials that are acting as um, cloud condensation nuclei are less soluble. They're less absorb they're less able to absorb water. And the reason um, this is important is basically because when you see a change in kappa, um, this implies a change in the particles that are forming cloud droplets. 
So when the dust arrives, we see a, we see a drop in that kappa. We see a change in the, the particle dynamics here, um, which basically suggests that the dust from Africa appears to be affecting the CCN activity. Just from these plots alone, that's what this is suggesting. If we use bulk methods, only bulk methods, the dust seems to be affecting CCN activity. But what I also want to point out is that we, if we look at the submicron particle loading, which, I go back to this guy, when we look at this plot, we're looking at nanometers, right? So 1,000 nanometers is one micron. So everything that we're looking at here is below its submicron. Um, so in order to understand the role that aerosols are playing in CCN activity during this time period, we need to look at particle chemistry below one micron. And the issue with bulk methods is that they don't tell you anything about size. So we have no idea what size we're looking at when we're looking at these bulk with this, this bulk data. Um, well, we can look at uh, size resolved uh, chemical data uh, from uh, SCM EDX. Okay, so this is the um, data from submicron uh, chemical analysis using SCM EDX. What you're seeing is that we have a couple different particle types um, that are sort of pervasive across the entire sampling period. So we have organics, we have sulfate, we have smoke, but we don't really have a lot of dust, um, which is interesting because the dust mass concentrations were telling us that there's a lot of dust during this time period. And there is, but it's just not in the submicron. Um, and this is important basically because this is tracking really well with our dust concentrations, which suggests that the dust and the smoke are being co-transported to the region. But when we look at the cloud, uh, the CCN uh, activity during this time period, uh, and we see that, okay, well, we need to look exclusively at the submicron to see what's, what's playing a role here. Um, it's the smoke and not the dust. So in reality, because we're looking at the submicron uh, chemistry in this middle plot, and that's what's affecting the CCN activity on this bottom plot, we can assume then that the smoke is actually playing a bigger role in the smoke is playing a bigger role in CCN activity than the dust is in the submicron part of the population. That is. Okay, and the last thing that I want to point out here is that when we have the arrival of these particles to the region, we're also seeing not just a change in which particles are acting as CCN, but we're seeing a change in the number of CCN. So we see an increase in the number of particles that can actually act as cloud condensation nuclei, which can potentially have an effect on the radiative properties of clouds. Because if you add more aerosols that can basically act as surfaces for the water to condense onto, you can therefore get um, basically more cloud droplets that produce a more reflective cloud. Um, so this goes back to what I was talking about with the aerosol indirect effect earlier. So the big takeaway from this slide here is that the transport of African smoke has a potential um, to impact the range of properties of clouds in the tropical Atlantic from that aerosol indirect effect that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. All right, so just the takeaways from this um, smoke, not dust, is affected in the submicron CCN loading during dust and smoke arrival. And then also the transport of African smoke aerosols has the potential to impact the radiative properties of clouds in the tropical Atlantic. Okay. So the last chapter that I'm going to talk about today is how aerosol mixing state affects nutrient deposition. Okay. Um, so just a little bit of context. The tropical Atlantic is home to both uh, marine and terrestrial ecosystems that rely on external inputs of iron and phosphorus. This includes the Amazon rainforest and the open um, Atlantic Ocean. And these external inputs have historically been assumed to be from long range transported mineral dust from Africa. Um, the issue with assuming this is that the nutrients from the dust might not be bioavailable. And why does this matter? Basically, this really matters because when you deposit nutrients into these ecosystems, they need to be readily available for uptake by the biology. Otherwise, they'll just get removed. They're, they're, the removal processes in these environments are very quick. If you deposit a bunch of really heavy dust to the surface of the ocean, it's just going to sink out if the, more, if the microorganisms that are there can't use up the nutrients immediately. If you deposit dust into the Amazon rainforest, the rain is very easily going to wash it out without actually um, the vegetation or the, micro, the uh, microbiome actually uptaking any of those nutrients. And what we see often is that when we look at um, soluble phosphorus and soluble iron um, with an increase in dust, we see that it's anti-correlated. So generally, when we, when we you know, see field data, an increase in dust results in a decrease in these bioavailable nutrients. 
Um, but there are other sources of bioavailable nutrients, or other potential sources of bioavailable nutrients. So we can have things like biomass burning um, that can potentially be providing soluble iron and phosphorus to these regions, um, which basically begs the question about whether or not we're estimating nutrient inputs properly. So the question that we're trying to answer here is which aerosols are contributing bioavailable phosphorus and iron to the tropical Atlantic? Um, so again, just gonna sort of breeze through this because we already talked about this. We're basically doing, um, we sampled the same time period that we did for the last chapter, so winter 2020 field sampling in Ibragic Point in Barbados. Um, we sampled during um, February of 2020. Um, this is showing the dust emissions. We have, again, the fire emissions, so we see that we're getting co-transported dust and silt. The methods that we're using, um, so in this case, we're gonna be using two bulk aerosol methods, uh, actually three bulk aerosol methods, and two um, single particle analyses. So for the bulk aerosol analysis, we're using that same dust mass concentration that I talked about before, when we are soaking the aerosols in some sort of water and then combusting um, the resulting filter. Um, we are also uh, soaking the aerosols in some sort of liquid to basically release um, either um, all of the elements that are present on the dust, so we sometimes do it in acid in order to get the total elemental composition, or we can do it in a bicarbonate solution to get the soluble graph to phosphorus concentrations. Basically, we're getting bulk measurements for, uh, for our total and soluble elemental content. Um, and then for the single particle analysis, we are doing, um, so this top figure here, we are getting chemical composition, um, from a method called Time of Flight Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry, or TOF-SIM, as I'll refer to it from this point forward. Um, and in this case, what you get is basically you have um, a laser that's essentially ablating the surface of the particle um, and giving us uh, um, surface chemical composition similar to our SPAMS instrument. Um, and in this case, we are also looking at um, elemental composition obtained from SEM edx where um, we image a, a micro, or basically a, a small particle and then shoot it with an x-ray and then we get surface elemental composition. Okay, so as I showed in the last presentation, we do have co-transported dust and smoke. And when we actually look at our total and soluble content of uh, phosphorus um, and iron, it tracks really well with that dust and smoke. Um, so this sort of suggests that um, it's coming from either the dust or the smoke, but from these bulk methods alone, we can't really tell which is which. We don't really know where the iron is, is present or where the phosphorus is present. Um, so bulk methods are not telling us the entire story. Um, and this is sort of the question that we're trying to answer here. Which particles are providing the iron and phosphorus? Okay, so I'm just gonna go through two different the two different particles that we're thinking about. So we're gonna look at the dust and we're gonna look at the smoke and see which one has nutrients. Which one has the nutrients and which one's most likely to be contributing bioavailable nutrients. So this is um, SEM EDX um, data, so for like a single dust particle. Um, and what we see is that when we increase dust mass concentrations um, for you know the time period that we're sampling, uh, we actually get an increase in soluble and percent soluble phosphorus, which is contradictory to what we were seeing in other previous literature, where an increase in dust mass concentration actually results in uh, a decrease in percent soluble phosphorus. Um, but remember, in those instances, they weren't necessarily sampling uh, smoke as well. Um, for our samples, we are an analyzing co-transported dust and smoke. So it's hard to tell just from this alone whether or not you're looking at the smoke or you're looking at an effect from the dust. So it looks like the dust is affecting, is actually like contributing a lot of percent soluble phosphorus. Uh, but yeah, what about the smoke? So what I'm gonna show here are some figures from toxins analysis. Now what we're seeing here is basically um, a field of view from the toxins instrument where the color, uh, the color intensity sort of represents the greater intensity of a particular component. Um, so you can see, So up here at the top, you can see that this is a particle, excuse me, this is a particle here, this is a particle here. So uh, you sort of get an idea of what we're actually looking at. Okay, and we know that this is dust um, because you can see that there is a high intensity of color um, for all of these particles for aluminum. Um, and we also see that there is a lot of sea salt present. So what I was talking before about, um, you know, 
particles being able to be mixed with multiple different chemical constituents, this is what I was referring to. So here we have what are called internally mixed um, sea salt and dust particles, where you have components of dust and sea salt in the same exact particle. So that's what we're seeing here. Uh, so we have these sea salt components that are basically attached to the dust components. Okay. And if we look at the nutrients here, we see that there is iron present, which we would expect because there's a lot of iron in the earth and if we're looking at dust from basically the soil, we would expect to see a lot of iron. So this is not surprising. Um, the phosphorus isn't really there. Um, yeah, not sure why. Uh, it's, not, it's not present. Um, we don't necessarily think that means that there's absolutely no phosphorus present on the dust, but it just means that this technique was not able to pick it up on this particular uh, particle type because, uh, basically because there's, there are so many other things that it, um, it's easily detecting. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about chemical processing. So what I mentioned before about um, aerosols being able to undergo chemical reactions in the atmosphere, one of the things that I mentioned was acidic gases. So things like uh, sulfuric acid and nitric acid can interact with, say, like a dust particle and make what typically would not be bioavailable, bioavailable. Um, and you can think about this, like if you try to eat a rock, it's not really gonna give you the nutrients that you need, even though it has phosphorus and, and iron in it. But if you process it, if you weather it, if you, you know, basically if you soak it in acid, you dissolve those nutrients and you make it more bioavailable for, for uptake. So in this case, we're looking at signs of chemical processing or chemical aging in the atmosphere. And what we have here are markers of sulfuric acid or this HSO4 and nitric acid, which is the nitrate here, the NO3. And what you can see is that the sulfate is kind of there, but it's not really there, but the nitrate is kind of there, which is, which is exciting. Um, so this sort of just suggests that there's, a, there's maybe a little bit of processing, um, but What's also important to note is that we do have that salt component and this Na2O, so what can happen a lot with um, sea salt is that you can actually get sea salt aged. Um, so when, um, <clears throat> when NaCl reacts with acids in the atmosphere, a lot of times what will happen is the chlorine will react with the acid and then get kicked off as, as HCl or hydrochloric acid, and then you're left behind with just the sodium. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So because we have that internal mixing with that sea salt and those dust components, we're actually getting um, the aging of the sea salt and not the mineral dust. So even though we have signs of aging on these particles, it's not in the dust. So we don't really think that the dust is really contributing to anything. So what we think is happening is that dust alone can't explain the trends in percent cycle phosphorus because there's a lack of chemical processing needed to make the nutrient-rich minerals bioavailable. So next is the smoke. So does the smoke contain bioavailable nutrients? This is a uh, classic image of a smoke particle, um, a lot of carbon, a lot of oxygen, um, sulfur and potassium are common constituents of um, biomass burning as well. So we know that's what we're looking at here. And again, if we look at our field of view, we can see that we have a really strong intensity of this potassium sulfate um, ion, um, which because potassium and sulfur are really strong indicators of biomass burning, um, suggests that we are looking exclusively at biomass burning particles in this sense. Um, we don't have any sodium chloride, we don't have any dust or any aluminum, so we're assuming that we don't have any sea salt and we don't have any dust from these particles, so we're just looking at biomass burning. Now, if we look at the nutrients on uh, in this field of view for these particles, we actually do see a pretty strong presence of both phosphate and iron. And if we look at chemical processing, so on the one hand, you would expect that the biomass burning could be bioavailable innately because it's a biological source or uh, an organic source at the very least. Um, but we also see that these particles undergo really intense chemical processing in the atmosphere. So the instance, like the concentration or the intensity of this sulfate ion, of this HSO4 ion, and the intensity of the nitrate ion suggests that these particles have undergone a lot of chemical processing. So if there are nutrients available on these particles or present on these particles, um, it very likely could be that they are bioavailable because of this chemical processing and because they are or an organic source of nutrients. So just, to, just the you know, takeaway here is that smoke could actually be explaining the percent soluble phosphorus trends that we're seeing because it's organic in nature and also undergoes extensive chemical processing in the atmosphere. So the main takeaway uh, from this study is that while dust contains both iron and phosphorus, the majority of iron and phosphorus likely isn't bioavailable in the dust um, due to a lack of chemical processing. 
However, um, smoke contains both iron and phosphorus, and as an organic source that's exposed to a lot of chemical processing, it could be a large source of cyclophosphorus. Um, so this is sort of the end of my presentation here. Um, I just want to sort of bring up two overarching conclusions that I want to uh, just sort of hammer home. Um, the, the bulk methods are basically telling us, from all three of these studies are telling us, that they're not sufficient for capturing the complexity of aerosols and understanding their roles for air quality, cloud formation, and nutrient deposition. Um, and what this means is that basically air quality models, climate models, and biogeochemical bio models need to incorporate aerosol mixing state um, in order to accurately parameterize the effects of aerosols on human health and on the climate. Um, so that's sort of the end of my presentation here. I just want to bring up a couple of acknowledgements. Um, number one, I want to thank my advisor, Cassandra Gaston. Um, she, I wouldn't be here without her. She's been absolutely fantastic this entire way. Um, and I am like forever grateful for the guidance that she provided. Um, my lab mates, Michael Sheridan, Hope Elliott, and Drew True, who helped immensely on these projects. Um, I also want to thank my collaborators. Um, just a few standouts are Sarah Hayes from USGS, Andrew Alt from New Michigan, um, Thomas Gill from University of Texas at El Paso, uh, Mira, Polker, Mira Polker at Troclos Institute, Emin Blades, um, who is the man who's been collecting our filters for the past several decades at the Barbados Atmospheric Chemistry Observatory, um, Amanda Aylert um, at Rasmus, Tour of China at PNNL, and then uh, Zihua Su at PNNL as well. Um, and yeah, thank you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. So you were showing the number fraction of different uh, species. Um, can you get the mass from that as well, from the imagery? Like, you have two-dimensional imagery, right? Yeah. Um, we, I don't think we can get the mass. I mean, because you don't have the third dimension for that, and you also don't have the density. I mean, you can make assumptions about the density, I think, of the, uh, of the particles, but it would be hard to get the volume. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how we would actually go about doing that, but I could see potentially making an effort to do it. I guess I was sort of wondering because, you know, the sulfate jumps around, mm -hmm. but it's really because dust plus, you know, the sulfate is 100% minus the dust minus the smoke. Right. So it looks variable, but it could well just be pretty constant. And it, you just, you can't really tell. And yeah. I, I guess, and sulfate's such a big CCN. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to know that that's staying pretty constant to support your conclusions, I think. Yeah, I think if you wanted to go about that, you could you could potentially do some sort of plot where you're just looking at, like, you're not doing a fraction, you're basically just looking at, like, how many particles of each particle type are in each bin for each day. That would give you a better idea of what you're actually looking at for composition. Yeah, but your sampling, it wasn't really consistent across the days, right? So that makes it harder to do that. Right. What about non-sea salt sulfate? Non-sea salt sulfate. Did you measure that? Uh, for which? For the uh, um, Eureka uh, campaign. Non-sea salt sulfate. I mean, the, I mean, the sulfate that we had was Right, but remember the, you showed bulk methods, right, for mm -hmm. elemental, but we also did bulk methods for IC. Right. So that would also give you the sulfate mass concentrations. Mm -hmm. Right, that would be another way to look at it. Did that come up at all during the reviews of that paper? Like, did people ask about the sulfate contribution being constant? Or? No. Question? I'm just dazzled you can go to single particles nowadays uh, and um, and it looks like you have enough um, enough atoms coming off that your spectra are, are well counted but I can't imagine how you know if you can count enough particles to get a representative sample but uh, you've gone all the way from bulk to um, not only single particle but the, uh, the skin versus the interior mm -hmm. being crucial and if you didn't have enough sample, could you do skin versus interior by size category or something, get a little more sample to it? Or is it is the technology just why not, you know, particle by particle? 
so yeah, actually, when we do the, so if I go back to, um, so with the toxins, it's a little bit harder because uh, they take quite a bit longer to analyze. So if you're looking at a field, oh yeah, like how this, big is that? Is that that's not a single? Is that the surface of a single particle, or is that a bunch of particles that share that have been filtered in the same layer? That's that? they're they're it's a field of view for like multiple particles. So each sort of like blob that you're looking at here, like this would be a single particle. This would be a single particle. Okay, yeah, this is a single particle. So we are looking at multiple particles in this field of view. Um, so we're able, it's it's single particle technique in a way that you can actually image um, individual particles and see how the chemical distribution looks across a single particle, but you're getting multiple particles in a field of view. You can also sample many and get enough statistics and stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. And then cool. when we do, when we do, for this is more of a qualitative technique, but when we do the um, SEM, um, so from the second chapter, Right, so when we're looking at these, like if we're looking at like a single like day, which is what each of those bars sort of represents, we're looking at like thousands of particles. So you can get better okay. statistics depending on the technique that you're using. All right, you're not just manually. <laughs> <laughs> Depends. So the first oh, the first okay. project that we did. So with the, um, let me see. For the first chapter, when we were looking at like the SEM here, yeah. it was manual. Yeah. Um, but that was just because of the facilities that we had available to us. So we analyzed about like. 50 to like 150 particles for like nine or 10 different dust samples. So it, it you know, it was pretty, pretty extensive amount of effort to get that data. But then you can just, you know, if you have, if you have the facilities available, you can very easily just stick a sample into an instrument and then get like thousands of particles in the course of like a couple of hours. So yeah, um, yeah the technology is pretty incredible for this, for, for this, uh, this study. <laughs> Days on there when there were no sulfate at all. That's really that's surprising. You can see with the SMPS data, like it goes from having two modes to one. Right? Remember that was something we had gotten into in your paper about mm -hmm. how if there was some sort of coagulation happening of some of the sulfate onto the transported particles or not. Basically, like if you're looking at like if you have an input of a lot of particles on, okay. I think she means the bottom plot, right? Where you see the two moods go to one. Right. So here you see from like the seventh of February to like the tenth of February, you have final distribution, um, which is indicative of like clean marine conditions. And then when you have the arrival of the dust, it goes to a unimodal distribution, um, and then. You know, you're seeing more of the sulfate showing up during those bimodal distributions. It's possible that when you have the arrival of the dust and the smoke, that you do get coagulation with the sulfate. So that's why you might not be seeing the sulfate present in this case. Yeah, if there are no further questions, I guess. Say thank you for the nice presentation. <laughs> thank you for coming. Come again on Friday morning for the first three 15 minute seminars of this semester. Yeah, nice talk, Haley. Thank you.